support for Conversations with Elle McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across the Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. I'm pleased to have as a guest today Akua Lee Ellis. Akua Lee Ellis is the Senior Vice President of Community Impact for Greater Twin Cities United Way. It's a role that provides leadership over United Way grant making, coalition engagement, systems change, public policy, and the agency's 211 resource helpline. Akua Lee Ellis is a champion for equity who's lobbied in multiple states and worked at local levels to advance critical business and civic objectives. She most recently served as Director of Social Justice Advocacy at Catholic Charities of St. Paul in Minneapolis, where she orchestrated a successful multi-year grassroots effort to secure millions in state funding to end and prevent homelessness. She previously worked uh, as a government relations officer for the southern region of the country on behalf of Target Corporation, and she created the community development strategy for what later became the St. Paul Promise Neighborhood, a network to support uh, and improve education outcomes and pave pathways of opportunity for children and their families in the Frogtown and Summit University neighborhoods. She did that as a legislative aide to the former city council member, uh, Melvin Carter, now mayor, mayor Melvin mayor, Carter. Yeah. Uh, Akua Lee Ellis holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and sociology from University of Iowa and a master's of public policy with a concentration in community economic development from University of Minnesota Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Akua, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Thank you for your service and thank you for your leadership. United Way is an important organization. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, I serve the organization as a member of its board of directors. I'm happy to be part of an august uh, group of leaders that uh, have taken on the important work of really identifying and addressing critical issues for our community. You have played a major role in understanding uh, systems change. It's an important concept. What does it mean in context of how the United Way moves towards what it has to be to serve changing communities in the future, first of all? Sure. So that's a, a big question. <laughs> I would say um, that United Way and um, the Greater Twin Cities United Way in particular um, is an organization of yes and. Um, so yes, we are providing support uh, to organizations that are on the ground um, providing support to individuals managing um, their own personal set of personal challenges mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's incumbent upon us to leverage our platform to get further upstream and help improve the context that those organizations are doing their work in. Um, you know there's the need to respond to real-time challenges um, and uh, the, the need to be curious about what is creating the need for the response in the first place. Um, and so we take a yes and approach and our systems change work is um, really geared to do just that. The perception of United Way for the community is generally one that provides funding mm -hmm. for any number of community organizations that provide direct services. And in the past, uh, I think over the years, people may have seen United Way support going to support the arts, to support culture in general, to support education. <laughs> in recent years to support uh, the rise of homelessness, uh, support mental health. How, how do, have you seen that transition over the years? What, sure. what was it like 20 years ago and, and how is it now and what do you see the future for the organization and for the work of philanthropy United Way is doing? 
Sure. Uh, so I'll uh, start by uh, sharing that I've been with the organization for 10 months now. So tell me about 20 years yeah, ago, so I, right? So I'll tell you what, what I understand about 20 years ago. <laughs> sure. uh, until 2006, we were doing our grant making through an affiliation model, mm -hmm. um, the, the more traditional United Way model. And then in 2006, started to move more into um, competitive grant rounds. And so that, you know, it's, it's, it's I've always known the United Way to do competitive grant making. Um, so it was interesting to me to see that that was a relatively new development in how we do our work. Um, so what does that mean? Yep, so that means that folks have to actually apply for uh, grant dollars. Um, and we are one of very few um, organizations that provide those dollars um, on a multi-year basis, mm -hmm. which has um, come to be really important in the nonprofit space. Uh, we had traditionally from 2006 until um, just recently done a series of um, multi-year grant rounds. So we might have one for safety net and that goes for three years. The next year we would release um, grant applications or an RFP for um, jobs uh, work or workforce development um, programming um, and, and the like. And so this year, this past um, year in November, we released an RFP that took all of our program areas um, and rolled them into one. Uh, to really fuel holistic solution making, um, and those grants will announce here uh, next week. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so very timely conversation. Timely conversation. Yeah. And so what's been the general response to the changes in strategy? Uh, there's probably been some pushback, some uh, maybe uh, not fear, but uh, anxiety. Yeah. It, because things were comfortable, but they are changing. Sure. So we have found, um, I'll say, like from a broader context perspective, mm -hmm. we've seen the landscape change in terms of how people are giving, what they give to, um, what motivates them to be a part of um, community. Uh, and so we are, you know, it's incumbent upon us to also evolve the way that we're mm -hmm. doing our work. Um, I will tell you that we rolled out a new strategy in October um, and there was understandably some concern and anxiety around what that would mean. Mm -hmm. um, I feel really proud of the way that we've um, been transparent in our communication and try to provide information as early as possible to our mm -hmm. partners because we understand that the funding that the Greater Twin Cities United Way provides is so incredibly important um, to the st partners that we serve. St yeah. st step back a second. It's a big number. Yes. Uh, United Way presents a lot of resources. What's the big picture? Sure. So we direct uh, 14 or will direct 14 million dollars mm -hmm. um, in multi-year grants here in the next couple of weeks um, that is part of a 60 million dollar investment that we make in community um, either through uh, supporting and um, uh, completing folks designations toward mm -hmm. particular organizations um, a whole host of other grant making programs that we operate and then the the kind of flagship of our work is our multi-year grant making and that's what's going to be released sure. um, here so, soon. So go ahead you were saying. So, say more. You were, you were saying before I interrupted you but let me switch. Okay. One of the priorities that uh, you carry under your portfolio is mm -hmm. coalition engagement. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for you? What do you do to create coalitions to bring a uh, solution uh, sure. providers together? So that goes back to that earlier question around systems change. Um, much of the work that we do to advance policy mm -hmm. is in coalition. Mm -hmm. um, so we're members of um, and funders of organizations such as MSP Win, um, Mini Minds, where I have the privilege of co-chairing uh, that work with Ann Mulholland at the St. Paul, Minnesota Foundations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're also uh, contributing to organizations such as Generation Next that are working in school districts, really trying to uh, disrupt inequity in, in education outcomes. We're in a number of spaces, um, including Ignite uh, After School, which is working on um, what we now term career and future readiness programming um, in support of that, both in terms of program delivery um, and building capacity among providers as well as policy. So all over. <laughs> I'm, I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest is Akua Lee Ellis. She's Senior Vice President of Community Impact at Greater Twin Cities United Way. And as I mentioned, in the spirit of transparency and disclosure, I serve as the director of the organization. Yes, thank you for your service. And I'm pleased to be part of the organization. You know, uh, Akua, uh, when we look at how we engage um, the this is not the right word, but the recipients, the uh, consumers mm -hmm. of the resources we organize and mobilize. How do we best serve? How do we assess what's needed? Yeah. And how do we best meet 
uh, the needs that we identify? That's a great question. I think it starts with asking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think oftentimes um, it's, it's easy to fall into patterns of this is the way we provide service or this is the way we do our work because it's the way we've always done it. Um, and there's wisdom gained through practice. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there's considerable wisdom in lived experience. Um, and just because someone is, is in need doesn't mean that they don't know what the answers are. They oftentimes lack access to the platforms or to the resources to help them um, address the, the solutions that they've identified. Something uh, that is of particular uh, interest to me, it's a, it's a, a point of passion. Um, we have re, uh, redone our, our scoring rubric or the way that we evaluate our multi-year grants um, to incorporate that understanding. Um, we want to know, we ask all the organizations that apply, how do you how do you listen to the people that you're serving? What is the extent to which they have the opportunity to weigh in on the delivery of those services? And how are you taking what you hear from the people that you're serving and using that to continuously improve your program? That's something that's um, wildly important to me. Is the sense that by doing that, by that approach, you uh, support this notion of uh, empowering people, uh, giving them uh, both the authority and the agency to speak on their own behalf and to act on their own behalf in concert with yeah. resources and coalitions. Is that the idea? Absolutely. And so we're taking that approach um, uh, at multiple levels. So it, there's the encouraging that, that practice among our partners through mm -hmm. our grant making, but also, um, you know, we are providing a service to nonprofit organizations and it's incumbent upon us to listen to them. Uh, so we'll bring back uh, the Council of Agency Executives in some form. I've been hesitant to call it that because there's, it's loaded and it comes sure. with a bunch of, of history, um, but the general concept is that um, we need to be listening to our constituents. Um, understanding what works. Uh, we've got a lot of feedback that we've already called from this last RFP that we'll be rolling out and testing. Um, it's really important to me that we're, we're listening just as much as we're asking our partners to listen to the, the folks that they're serving. Uh, Akuali, I think people don't, uh, Akuali Ellis, yes. people don't think enough about uh, the critical value uh, United Way provides uh, to uh, donor organizations. I think that uh, you create a bridge, a pathway mm -hmm. for companies mm -hmm. and individuals to maximize the good they do, to yeah. follow their good intentions and to be of genuine benefit That's to right. organizations and individuals. So how do you get that message out and keep companies and individuals motivated and giving mm -hmm. to the organization? That's the million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think some of it um, is us getting really uh, tight in our ability to articulate the impact that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've been modest um, in, in recent years um, and because we show up in so many different spaces. It's, it's easy for the United Way to be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. um, it's an important platform, though, uh, to, to your earlier point. Um, I think there's an opportunity for us to, um, and we are starting to approach um, our, our relationships with corporations, um, on a year-round basis, so not just in time of a uh, United Way campaign, but what are some ways that we can be um, engaging organizations or um, corporations, employees, um, in a way that is meaningful to them, that provides access to be a part of the solution for our community, um, and really builds uh, buy-in for them to stay put. You know, we could be a really helpful tool in retention. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, I think there are lots of ways for us. I, we've done great work in the corporate space, um, I think we've got an opportunity to go even deeper, and I'm excited about what's what's ahead for that work. I ask my guests uh, quite often to tell their personal story in the last minute or so of the program. One so minute. it's short, yeah. <laughs> but, but the idea is where do you come from? How do you get yeah. to where you are? I think it's obvious that you have passion. Mm -hmm. uh, your your uh, training and experience, both are impeccable. And so what brings you to this point of making a difference in our community? What motivates and guides you personally yeah. in this work? So uh, I've, I've had people ask the question, how do you get here? And I tell um, folks that um, I'm smart and you'll be hard pressed to outwork me, but that is becoming less, <laughs> less uh, true. Uh, I can't work like I used to work, which is probably a good thing. Um, you know, I am someone who believes very deeply that greatness um, in many forms resides in each and every one of mm -hmm. us. Um, and what motivates me is um, being of service, giving as much of myself as possible in service to uncover as much of that as possible. 
What's your uh, sense of the future? Uh, what are you pessimistic or optimistic? I know that you're optimistic, but talk about. I am an eternal optimist <laughs> talk and about, a realist. <laughs> talk about your vision. Uh, where will we go? Where can we go as a community? Uh, you're working very hard. You've worked very hard. I work hard. Yeah. Uh, do we believe that this work is really worth it? And will our work bear fruit? What's your feeling? So I absolutely think this work is worth it. Uh, you know, the, the piece that I am generally optimistic around, but sometimes experience bouts of, of pessimism, is whether or not we as a community are willing to be honest about what's really going on, mm -hmm. um, what's at the heart of some of our challenges. Right now, a lot of our program uh, partners, they're managing symptoms mm -hmm. of a much deeper challenge um, mm -hmm. or set of challenges. Um, you know, we've got a pretty progressive state, um, but we also move at the comfort of the people in charge. Um, and I'm no exception to that. You know, some of the changes that we're making and rolling out here, um, they're not comfortable. And I think they're absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but if we don't have more folks who are in positions of authority or power, willing to um, share that power, um, willing to take risks, willing to make mistakes, um, you know, we won't advance to the extent that, that it's possible. Akua Ellis, <laughs> I think you said it all. <laughs> Uh, thank thank you. you so much for being here. Thank you for what you do. Thanks to the Greater Twin Cities United Way for their commitment. Thanks to Comcast for yes. being a partner with you and supporting uh, the work of United Way. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, pleased to have as a guest today Steve Winfield. Steve Winfield is the uh, driving force behind the Dave Winfield Student Athletic Awards. We're talking about we're talking about that uh, program that's moving into its 43rd year. It's a wonderful thing. Steve, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Before we start, let me thank our sponsor, our sponsor for this program, our sponsors for this program include Old National Bank and Twin Cities Home Ownership Alliance. Thank them for their support. So at the heart of the Winfield Awards is a story of personal success, success motivated by a passion to achieve greatness, and a desire to give back to the family and community in which Dave Winfield grew up. The Winfield Awards was created in 1977 to encourage young people of color, uh, and uh, it has benefited more than 410 deserving young men and women. The Winfield Awards Committee's primary concern, primary concern is not the awards themselves, but what the awards seek to accomplish. Uh, as young people strive to uh, become finalists, whether successful or not, they have all made strides towards maximizing their potential. In the process, they're making progress towards becoming motivated, contributing adults who are not only better themselves, but their families and communities as well. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. My Let me pleasure. just have you build on that. You know, as you and the family uh, developed and brought this exercise online, what discussions did you have among yourselves about what is needed and what you could do to help f fill the need in our community? Well, actually, it was some community people, um, people like, uh, it's almost like my big brother, Frank White, and it was Al Nunes, and, uh, you know, myself, and, you know, a number of other community people talked about uh, there were some different awards out there recognizing uh, young people mm -hmm. in the state, but uh, a number of those didn't really kind of include us in it, any of the kids of color. And so um, we talked with uh, my brother David and talked about it'd be nice if we had an award instead of just honoring one person, how about if we uh, honor a number of people and uh, some young men and young women and he said how about five boys and five girls and it's not good enough for them just to be jocks um, he said having uh, uh, good grades in school and participate in things in the community uh, 
those were all important parts of being a complete person and growing up in this world. And so uh, we started it back then. And instead of waiting till somebody dies and you name something after them, a lot of times we said, hey, we got Dave Winfield, who's alive, and we didn't know how far his, com his uh, career was going to go. And mm -hmm. ended up being a nice long career. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we named it after him, Dave Winfield Minority Student Athlete Awards. Mm -hmm. and. We've just been fortunate, we've been blessed to keep going. You know, all of a sudden it's 43 years. And, and you've touched so many lives. You know, it's a beautiful thing, and I'm sure you've had surprises. I think you probably have stories mm -hmm. about uh, things you didn't expect to happen mm -hmm. or outcomes that uh, amazed you, uh, that gave you joy and satisfaction because of the impact on both individual and community lives. Any, anything come to mind at all? Well, I think sometimes you look out of those, uh, you know, 400 plus young people that we've given recognition to, mm -hmm. and um, we've dealt with basically the kids have to live in St. Paul or go to school in St. Paul mm -hmm. or both, and um, just see how some of the things that they've accomplished. You know, we have some people who, you know, I could name some people. There's like, a, well, probably off the top of my head, the first one is uh, Melvin Carter, the mayor. He was one of our uh, <laughs> outstanding uh, student athlete awards mm -hmm. winners. And then there's Lisa Lissamore, mm -hmm. who's, uh, uh works with the State High School League. And uh, we've got um, Mitch McDonald, Dr. Mitch McDonald. A lot of people know Kwame. That's Kwame's, sure. uh, the late Kwame's son. And Mitch was a former reporter for Insight News, a columnist for Insight News. So, there yeah. you go. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Val Littles Butler, she's assistant principal at uh, mm -hmm. Central High School, and mm -hmm. I hope she gets a chance to be a principal there since the uh, mm -hmm. present uh, principal is retiring. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, just a, you know, a lot of good people who come out of there. In fact, uh, there's a young man, um, Rosario, who uh, was one of our former winners. His dad was one of our winners back in '81. So multi-generational. So yeah, so, you know, there's a number of people who have done well and have come through and, have, you know, you know, say doctors and uh, there's some people in the legal field. There's people who have just done a lot of community mm -hmm. things, law enforcement, mm -hmm. so a lot of things. So mm -hmm. just proud of them, just proud to well, you, see how they've represented the community well. You pr produce a, a great program book. This is a sample of last year's book for the 42nd Annual Winfield Awards. You'll be doing that again. When is the awards this year? And, and I love this book because it just has such a lot of information. And it's wonderful to list the names of uh, both recipients and supporters because I think we don't give ourselves credit enough and you take the time to thank people and to give credit and shine a spotlight on those who are doing the right things for the right reasons. Yeah, well, uh, again, you, you see the book and it's, it is good to, um, you know, we don't have any winners and other people are losers. Mm -hmm. It's like all 10 kids uh, get recognition mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the the top winners maybe get a thousand each and uh, the the other awardees, they're all awardees mm -hmm. and they're all recognized and all appreciated and, you know, they get money for college also. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. wherever they want to, you know, end up going to school after that. And like I said, each year we, you know, we list the kids from the uh, kids, I guess, young people <laughs> from the, you know, from the past and there so you could see their names and, you can look back and they say, oh, yeah, I know him. Uh, yeah, they're doing good and they're doing many different things. And again, like you said, the, the sponsors sometimes, the, you know, from the small businesses that support us over the years. And then there's the big ones, too, that, you know, as you know, you appreciate. Sure. You know, the Minnesota Absolutely. Twins yeah, have been yeah. one of yeah. our big sponsors over the years. And, uh, you know, so, um, you know, just really appreciate. It's like a nice community event there's so many negative things that are sometimes in the news mm -hmm. that it's it's just a nice family affair mm -hmm. on that first june and uh, that first sunday in june every year mm -hmm. and um so the people have been there people have been coming just about 
for 40 years who yeah. have come to the event and things. Yeah. And so I really appreciate that. Well, I can tell you it's so significant, uh, Steve. I mean, phenomenally important that you have taken the time and you and the team, the colleagues, uh, the organizers and those who stayed with you to recognize how important it is to hold up our own community and our own young people. And even with the notion that you are awarding uh, uh, outstanding student athletes of color. So it's not just our immediate, you know, black kids. Uh, none of our families are black alone anyway, uh -huh. <laughs> right, right? Absolutely. And so we really are genuinely part of this idea of communities of color and you are intentional in reaching towards other uh, communities inside that spectrum. I think that's a wonderful thing. Well, it's interesting because when we started back then, you could pretty much tell where the kids of color were. They were either going to uh, Central High School, mm -hmm. I think Mechanic Arts was closed at that point, or Humboldt on the west side. And uh, uh, so we worked with some cool people over there, Larry Lucio and Donnie Luna, mm -hmm. you know, who mm -hmm. are, you know, original committee members and part of our board. And, and um, you know, so then you pretty much knew all the kids. You could name them and said, well, we got this person going to Humble. We've got this person going to Central. Mm -hmm. Now, thing, the demographics and things have changed and there's uh, our, our kids of color and from different uh, countries, you mm -hmm. know, who are spread out through all the schools in St. Paul. So it's, uh, sometimes it looks like a little United Nations mm -hmm. sitting up on the, uh, well, you know, up in front of the and, and it crowd. Looks, it looks like the future. Yeah. It is the future. That's the reality, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I think it's wonderful to be in a position to recognize that and to engage and celebrate it and to lift it up through um, acknowledging the achievement of young people and uh, the communities that uh, give them, uh, you know, the, uh, the launching pad. Uh, to become best uh, citizens. As you say, you know, it's not just about athletics, not about being just a jock, but about being a scholar. And it's not just about being, uh, you know, uh, only the doctors and only the lawyers, but you have people that go into all kinds of professions and they stay connected, they keep giving. You mentioned some other people that are stellar. Uh, sort of names that have been associated. You mentioned Larry Fitzgerald, for example, and you mentioned some more off, off camera, but name some of the people that have been involved with the program because it's good to see that people are connected and stay connected. Well, we've had, um, well, just even some of the people who have uh, spoke to, to the young people. We usually have a, a keynote speaker, and even going back to the early days where we had thought that more was better, I think, start at the Martin Luther King Center down in the gym down there. Mm -hmm. when tickets were five dollars or something and we had up on the uh, speaking to the kids actually had Tony Dungy who mm -hmm. you know we know is mm -hmm. Hall of Fame NFL coach and then Michael Thompson you know who his son Clay you know mm -hmm. plays in the NBA. Uh, they were both seniors at the U and uh, had the athletic director of the U there and so forth so we used to try to have we thought more was better, but now we just have one person mm -hmm. speaking to the people. And we've had um, some judges speak to the people. We've had the chief of police, you know, speaking to the people, you know, to the young people mm -hmm. and to the audience, bringing mm -hmm. message to them. Uh, we had anywhere from a Mike Max, uh, CCO, but then we've had uh, Daryl Thompson, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, former gopher, and uh, had Tony Sana, you know, the soccer uh, star who mm -hmm. has a great foundation and um, just brought in just a lot of different people, males and females, to bring a message to the young people and to the community and to the community. It's just so important for people to be there for, for the young people. And sometimes it's, it's not a complicated thing that you do. And we're not uh, the biggest uh, event going on, but we just try to make it a quality event. And anytime you have community people involved and just being there for the young people, I think that makes such a big difference. Mm -hmm. I really do. Mm -hmm. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, my guest is Steve Winfield here on behalf of the Dave 
Winfield Student Athletic Awards Ceremony. It's coming up uh, the first Sunday in June of this year. It's going into its 43rd year recognizing and lifting up young people in our community, not just athletes, though they start with that and from that, but students who uh, deserve our embrace, our support, our, our applause, and who have uh, in history uh, given back to community. We set up a condition uh, or an opportunity for these students to, to give back. Uh, you know, Steve, I think the program is just phenomenal, and uh, I guess I'd like to know what our listeners and our readers and viewers can do to support, to show up, number one, but also you may be uh, receptive to uh, either business or individual support, financial support. How can people get involved? Well, we will have uh, some more information out there. You'll have it to be able to put out there to, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, be in the papers and in the news and things, but it's always the f uh, first Sunday in June mm -hmm. and it's at the Intercontinental. Mm -hmm. Hotel downtown St. Paul It'll be at five o'clock on that Sunday, and um, you know people can buy ads to go in the book. Um, they can make donations. They can just come to the banquet, just be there, be a part of what's what's going on. And so we'll have more information out there. But it letting you know for sure that mm -hmm. that's when it's going to be. It's going to be June second, and it's going to be a good time. And if you want a nice positive thing to go, go to. Sometimes you get tired of hearing the negative stuff on the news. Mm -hmm. You want to have a good feel good night and then that be the time to show up and support the young people. I think that's the message for today. Steve Winfield, thank you so much. Oh man, good to see you as good always. To see you. Man. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland and we'll talk more with um, uh, people in community about important events. This is what I've always promised. Uh, this program presents robust conversations, information that matters. We've done that today. Steve, thank you so much. My pleasure. And thank you for listening and, and watching. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest today is Julia Israel. She is a respected leader in the Twin Cities real estate community. Over the past 18 years, she's owned several real estate related businesses and trained and coached hundreds of real estate professionals. She's a licensed real estate broker in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and she serves as the productivity coach for Keller Williams Realty Integrity Lakes, which is located in Uptown Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. She's uh, currently the president of Twin Cities National Association of Real Estate Brokers, it's called NARAB, and uh, is the oldest black trade association in the country. She serves on the board of directors for the Minnesota Association of Realtors and the Housing Opportunity Committee for the National Association of Realtors. She's on other uh, boards and committees as well. Uh, one thing that uh, I can say about her is that she's got a, uh, a passion for building stronger communities by promoting home ownership, especially in diverse neighborhoods. She's the co-founder and chair of the Umoja Community Development Corporation, UCDC. It's a nonprofit that works to build inclusive communities where people can attain home ownership and benefit from community. Julia, welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Thank you, thanks good, for having me. Good to have you back. We've had this conversation before. We have. But we uh, can't talk enough about the importance of home ownership and wealth building in our community. Mm -hmm. And so I, for one, am pleased that you've taken a leadership role uh, over a long period of time to continue to sound the alarm about the value yes. of becoming a homeowner. But I'll let you mm -hmm. talk about why this passion exists in you and what the message is for our viewers and our listeners. Uh, okay, well, um, the reason it's tremendously important to me is that uh, there's a lot of different ways that people in general build wealth. Um, and really the best way that I know of to build wealth, uh, sometimes even better than any stock or bond is through real estate. And 
particularly as African Americans, as the black community, uh, that is an area where we don't have a lot of ownership in real estate, especially in Minnesota. We have the lowest home ownership rate uh, in the country, um, in a state that holds the highest home ownership rate mm -hmm. in general. So, uh, so the gap is huge. The gap is very, very large. And if people are building wealth through real estate and we don't have any, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm very passionate about making sure that people understand what that means to own real estate, uh, understand what it means as far as using real estate as a vehicle for their families to build wealth as a legacy. Um, and uh, making sure that we, we really promote home ownership to get people into houses, not just to get into the house, but for the longevity of it. What is it that uh, we don't understand about uh, the importance of equity mm -hmm. and owning a house? Mm -hmm. And I, I want to raise that question, but only as a beginning of the conversation, because I don't want to leave the impression that there's something inadequate in us right. that yeah. keeps us out of home yeah. ownership. There are conditions that are environmental Absolutely. and structural yeah. that are part of this as well. But part of it has to be what our internal drive is. Correct. What is it that we need to be more attuned to, to be persistent and effective in pursuing equity and ownership? That's a really, really good question, uh, particularly because recently I had the pleasure of being on the radio show with a woman who is the director of uh, Mapping Prejudice Project. Mm -hmm. And they went into the history of how it got like this. Okay. It didn't just get like this because we didn't want to buy homes or we were lazy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was very intentional that we were kept out of buying homes and owning homes. Um, and so you know, they, they were speaking a lot about the history of how it became this way. Uh, so I'm glad that you brought up the point. It's not just because we didn't have the desire or the drive to own. We were intentionally shut out mm -hmm. of owning homes and buying homes. Uh, it, you know, and they um, have been doing some history on deed restrictions that prevented us from buying houses. Uh, since then, however, you know, we can always go back in history of what did happen to us. Uh, but where is our responsibility in that now? Mm -hmm. um, and, and really what I, I would say to that is that just getting the education of, uh, you're right, a lot of it is, is not self-imposed. We didn't self-impose poverty on ourselves, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but understanding what that means and getting educated about what homeownership is. A lot of people don't even know what the term equity means, right. you know, so what is equity? How do I get money? You know, what that means, what equity is, is it means you have cash value, you have money, uh, wealth, you know, and people don't um, even in, in that aspect understand what exactly that means to the family. So first I think is just um, for us and the reason that I'm so passionate about it is primarily because I wanna educate people mm -hmm. about what that means. Uh, what is the value of buying a home? What does equity mean? Why is it relevant to us? And, and what would that change if more of us had it? Mm -hmm. you know? So um, I don't know if that answered your question. Well, it's but, the, yeah. it begins the discussion. Yeah. You know, it's important to have the conversation, I believe. As you were talking, I was remembering uh, Al McFarland as a 20-year-old, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the thought came to mind of when uh, a North Side business owner approached me about uh, getting life insurance. Mm. And at 20, I might have been 22, 23, but at that age, I thought I was invincible mm -hmm. and that I would live forever. Mm -hmm and that insurance was for people that were weak mm -hmm. and that, that thought they were going to die, which I never would. Right, so yeah. The is how, how does a guy that's college educated become so stupid, uh -huh. uh, you know, and operate so blindly mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, uh, a, uh, with misinformation mm -hmm. and disinformation that really deserves him, his mm -hmm. family, and those who follow him? Mm -hmm. How do we wake up and mm -hmm. raise up our young people into the reality of the critical need to understand money and to not be funny about money, mm -hmm. to know money has a purpose in our lives and that we're okay mm -hmm. with money, uh, not controlling us, but using money to build communities, lifestyles that work for us. What do you think mm -hmm. about that? And I, th I think that kind of ties into your last question of like, where's our responsibility in that? So, so people like us who now understand, mm -hmm. uh, it's our civic duty to explain to the other people who don't understand mm -hmm. um, and, and help them uh, see what that looks like. And I think that goes back to even how media, you know, and uh, TV and radio show us sometimes if people don't see someone who looks like them, who is successful and say, hey, how did you get that way? Mm -hmm. You know, how did, how did you get all that money? Um, how, did you, how did you send your kids to college with, with no debt? You know, mm -hmm. how did you do those things? If we're not vocal about it, 
and sharing that information with other people, they won't know and they will remain ignorant, mm -hmm. you know, and not intentionally, just don't know. People don't know what they don't know. Uh, I talk to a lot of people and I'm, I'm frequently surprised by things people thought or things they just didn't know. And really what everybody says at the end of the conversation is I just didn't know what I didn't know. Um, so a lot of that responsibility is on the people who have overcome that and have like, you know what, I did buy a house and this is what I was able to do with it. Or I got insurance and this is why I did it. Mm -hmm. uh, not just hoarding that information for mm -hmm. yourself, but sharing it, but being willing to share it mm -hmm. with everybody else in the community and being vocal about uh, the reason you did it, how you did it, who you used to do it, where you went to get the information. And it, it is our responsibility to share that with each other because people don't know what they don't know. Yeah, and so you're doing that not only on a personal level, but on an organizational mm -hmm. and institutional mm -hmm. level. I mentioned that you are the president of uh, Twin Cities uh, uh, National Association mm -hmm. of Real Estate Brokers, NARIB. Yeah. And you guys make that a mission mm -hmm. and a passion, a place mm -hmm. where people that are passionate like you can channel uh, mm -hmm. getting education, uh, destroying ignorance in our community. Yeah, yeah, Talk yeah. about NARAB as an organization yeah. and what's on the table right now. Okay, so NARAB is, uh, we in short call it the Black Real Estate Association, mm -hmm. but NARAB is a national association. They've got chapters all around the country, mm -hmm. um, many of them very large, but it, it began long ago because as real estate professionals, we did not used to be able to uh, belong to the National Association of Realtors. So NARAB was where black people went to mm -hmm do the real estate business. Uh, and it exists today really for a lot of the same reasons. You know, we still have the same challenges, the same advocacy is required. Uh, so, so that's why it exists. And locally, um, our chapter was established about four years ago and we found that there were a lot of black real estate professionals uh, kind of doing their own thing, you know, separately. Good work, mm -hmm. a lot of good work happening here and there, um, but we really are a lot stronger when together. we come together. Sure. I kind of thought about that when I was trying to put my hair in this little ponytail this morning <laughs> and the one little rubber band I used broke, you mm -hmm. know, so I put three of them together. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you know, it's a lot stronger that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's still holding up, you know, <laughs> it's, it's two o'clock and it's yeah. still holding up. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of the same concept. We were individually doing different things throughout the community. But when we come together, it's a lot stronger and our voice is heard a lot more mm -hmm. and we are able to put our resources together. So that's what our Twin Cities chapter is about. Um, we do do a lot of advocacy uh, and we do a lot of education. Um, we do a lot of education, not only for the community, but for even our members, uh, because you know, there's a lot of things I don't know about insurance. I'm not an insurance agent, I'm a, I'm a realtor. Mm -hmm. you know? And so we learn from each other things we don't know so collectively we can go out as a group and educate the rest of the community uh, we actually have a really big event coming up on April 13th, mm -hmm. and you're hosting, um, you're going to be the moderator be for moderating. our That's panels, right. yeah. um, on April 13th at the Minneapolis Public School Building right there on Broadway mm -hmm. um, from 10 to, uh, don't get me to lie, 10 to 2, I believe is the time, 10 to 2, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 10 to 2, but uh, there'll be many vendors, and a lot of them are the organizations that we work for, mm -hmm. uh, represented giving information about uh, insurance, about home buyer education, about down payment assistance, about real estate services, about all kinds of different things to educate our community. Mm -hmm. So what our chapter is really about is one advocacy in the community and making sure that, you know, you're not passing any bills that we don't know about because sometimes that happens, mm -hmm. you know, or, or they'll, they'll, people will consult with other agencies that aren't us for us mm -hmm. or by us, mm -hmm. you know, we want to make sure that if it's concerning us, we're involved in that conversation. We're at the table. Yeah. yeah, and so that's what we're about. And then we're educating each other and then using that information in, in numbers to go out and educate our community. So that's our, our most recent coming up event is the April 13th Home Buyer Expo. Yeah. How much resistance uh, to um, adopting knowledge and adopting change is there in our community? What are the barriers that uh, you uh, observe in our own people mm -hmm. towards uh, changing mm -hmm. lifestyle changing perspectives mm -hmm. so that we have a, a more proper and accurate you know view of mm -hmm. the real world mm -hmm. fear fear yep. yeah yeah it uh, almost always it boils down to fear even in clients that we help mm -hmm. and they are in the homeowner they've, they've mm -hmm. decided yes i understand now i got the information i want to do this for my family mm -hmm. i'm going to move forward even through the whole process they're they're fighting fear okay um you know a fear of failure fear of not knowing enough mm -hmm. fear of being taken you know, a lot of people did purchase homes, you know, back when, before the market crashed and mm -hmm. uh, got misinformation mm -hmm. from yeah. people that didn't look like us, and you know, burned. and they got burned yeah. and they, they hear about that and they know about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're afraid that will happen to them. 
Um, so a lot of it is is mainly uh, fear of of fear of maybe if I go to the lender, they're going to reject me. I don't mm -hmm. want to be rejected. I, I've mm -hmm. heard this story. You've heard it before too, where. Uh, the story is that for a, a white person seeking a mortgage, uh, he applies or she applies at one bank, gets accepted, and then goes to bank two, bank three, bank four, shopping for the best rates, the best deal. Mm -hmm. For the average African-American consumer, he or she uh, shops, uh, and fear is guiding the shopping. Mm -hmm. And when the first banker says, you know, I can do this uh, mortgage for you, but it's at a crazy interest rate, so happy to get it, so happy to not be rejected that you mm -hmm. accept the first deal and you don't go mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. compare. Is that still mm -hmm. a real story? It's still a real story or, or worse. Mm -hmm. They go to that first banker and they say, I can't help you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the story they live with. Okay, and that's it. That's it. They're they don't, they don't go up. to bank two or three or four. Uh, they just stop at one and say, well, no, I can't. That's not for me. They told me no. You so know. so, so what, what's the role of Al McFarland? What's the role of media? Mm -hmm. This program, Conversations with Al McFarland, what can we do to help change the narrative, to create a new narrative mm -hmm. so that our mm -hmm. people both have knowledge and with knowledge power mm -hmm. to make proper decisions? What do you think? Um, I, think what it, you know, I think what would be really helpful is just showing the other side of that. You know, a lot of times different organizations or people will talk about all the stuff we don't have and why we can't have it and why we're the least of, but showing uh, the people that do have mm -hmm. and how we got it. And where we're at now, you know, showing it in a positive image because there's a lot of people that have it, mm -hmm. you know, but the problem is- And it can be done. They don't know them. That's right. You know, That's right. And, and so, you know, just exposing the positiveness of it can be done and hearing from people at the expo will have some homeowners actually speak. Like, I too was afraid, I mm -hmm. too did this, but here's where I am now. When people see that mm -hmm. in the media, and that's what's presented, they realize that, hey, they look like me, and they did it, and they said, they got the same credit score I got, you know? Mm -hmm. And they realize it is actually uh, a feasible thing that they can attain. Yeah. Julia, thank you so much for thank being you, here. Thank you, Al. Is there a contact name, number, or a place that people yes. can reach you to, for inf information? Uh -huh. First, email? I'll give you our website for NARAB. It is NARABTC, that's N-A-R-E-B-T-C, mm -hmm. .com, and you can find information about NARAB there. Uh, or feel free to go to my website. It's got all the information about the upcoming event that we have, and that's juliaisrael.com. Excellent. Yep. Thank yep. you so much. Uh, thank you, Julia thank Israel. You. Thanks also to uh, these companies in Twin Cities that support this program, uh, the Home Ownership uh, Alliance. Yes, the Home Ownership uh, an Alliance. Important yes. sister organization to NERAB, yes. I believe. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Old National Bank for supporting these conversations yeah. about home ownership and wealth creation mm -hmm. in our community. Mm -hmm. See you next time. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Support for Conversations with Al McFarlane was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company